Dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to the second part of the conference, Miroslav Tuzman in the Paradigm of Knowledge. Uh, first speaker in the second panel is Professor, uh, Professor Guillaume de Valk from the University of Leiden. And I'm very proud that due to his contribution to the Zagreb Security Forum and in general uh, to the information and com uh, communication sciences and, and security sciences, he was the first winner of the Miroslav Tuzman Award that we established in the honor of the Miroslav. So, Guillaume, thank you very much. Please wel welcome again for and thanks for joining us and you and to all of you others. And please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you especially for this uh, invitation to uh, participate in the conference uh, dedicated to the first anniversary of uh, the passing by of uh, Professor Tuchman. It's, it's a real honor and privilege uh, to be here. I should try to share my PowerPoint. Can you see? Yes, I see nodding. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, okay. Um, what I will do, I will more or less continue where uh, Professor Vidovic stopped. He gave the overview of what is needed, and I will pick out uh, one element, and that is uh, the data that we use to protect our critical infrastructure. And I will deal with two concepts there, uh, shaping the environment and augmented intelligence. I will explain them both. Um, Yes. Um, the idea is that there's a lot of, uh, let's say, deception and misinformation. And uh, a famous quote from that is by uh, Captain Kirk of Star Trek. And he quotes, we have them just where they want us. So we think they are, we are fine. And that's exactly where the uh, other party wants uh, to have us. Um, no? Uh, what we're going to do with is with the threat, and the, especially more the cyber threat to our critical infrastructure, and that's composed of the opponent's intentions, capabilities, activities, and this mini diminished by our resilience. And we'll focus there on two items. On the activities, it's about the gray zone, how we can lower the detection threshold, and how we can lower the deployment threshold so how can we see things earlier than before and how can we act earlier than before and a method in that or new development in that is augmented intelligence i will explain uh, both concepts first uh, the gray zone uh, is very often seen as uh, the covert and illegal activities that are below the threshold of let's say, organized or armed violence. It's meant uh, as, a, as a means of subvert, subversion, and it's an uh, integrated design to achieve strategic advantage uh, in the other party. In this case, uh, we take the perspective that we are the target. Um, and we want to do two things with gray zone. We want to lower detection threshold, so fewer shaping activities remain undisclosed. And we want to act earlier than before. Um, so we uh, need to uh, lower the threshold to act. So if we can do that, we will reduce the grade zone significantly and we'll show you how we use a lot of data unused at the moment and how we maybe can improve it. Um, we can do that with augmented intelligence, and later on I will explain uh, of what elements it can be composed. Um, and it, augmented intelligence is, is mainly how to extend the human capacity through software. It can be by memory, by sequencing, by problem solving and decision making, uh, assisted by, let's say, machines, so machine uh, learning. So it's not uh, that machines will replace uh, human uh, activities, but it's more a pairing 
of humans and machines participating in the analytic uh, product. So it's a kind of combination of both. Um, one of the elements I, I will work out in depth in where we definitely can gain uh, things to protect our uh, critical infrastructure uh, is the machine learning and then especially the deep learning where uh, the computers uh, learn themselves, uh, create new algorithms and come to insights that we never can come to as humans because they simply can process much more. And that's done through neural uh, networking. Um, in the ideal situation, we can move towards uh, human analysis, and machine analysis, and try to merge that. And that idea is called augmented intelligence and that could be the next revolution in analysis. Um, what are the strengths of both? Well, if you look at computers and machines, they are very fast, they can process many data, and they have a real-time output. So they process so fast that in the blink of the eye, uh, you have the outcome. Um, there is a weakness though. Um, if you look at computers, they are very good at correlations, uh, not so much at causality. And then there's the problem of being judicious, uh, in the sense that you just monitor everything that's a deviation uh, from the standard. Um, in uh, a democratic legal order, uh, it's not something uh, that's wanted. Actually, that's, that could be very unwanted. So that's a weakness. If you look at human analysis, they are very good in causalities, in modeling, making theories, uh, testing, and also what's called non-linear problem solving. Humans are able to make assessments even where data are more or less absent. So uh, an example of that are so-called red cell experiments, where you attack your uh, critical infrastructure and then see if you can come up with things no one thought of before. There's a weakness though, uh, we are very slow in processing data and we have a very limited uh, capacity in processing data. So no real-time output is just limited data. Um, if you look at uh, defending uh, 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 critical infrastructure, and uh, more in the domain of security and, and defense, uh, you see that there was always a large emphasis in the physical domain. So if you look at the Netherlands and you look at critical infrastructure, until 10 years ago, it was quite normal that the head of security was a former police officer um, and very much educated in, let's say, the physical protection of your uh, critical infrastructure. And you see that we are now moving uh, fast forward, uh, changing into the digital domain. If you come uh, and you look at the security uh, offices of some uh, security uh, of some uh, critical infrastructure, you see complete change at the moment. Uh, so you see really the uh, IT uh, experts taking over. Um, the other thing is is that you also see in protecting the critical infrastructure is the role of uh, the population. They can be both a perpetrator, attacking it, but also a sensor. So um, the role of the population is changing. Um, you can see that even the crowd is uh, outnumbering and censoring uh, the classic gatekeepers of security. Uh, Bellingcat, for example, is, is a famous uh, example of that, where skilled people uh, do analysis there. Um, Overall, human analysis is not enough, it's not fast enough, enough. And as we live in an information society, um, we can less and less uh, rely on denial, so that other people don't get uh, uh, critical information, and we must rely more on either deception or uh, processing more data. Um, how could you enhance that? potential of processing more data. So as a way to make the next step to augment the intelligence. But first of all, um, especially in the critical infrastructure by nature, 
uh, everything is connected to everything. So we have the Internet of Things. So if we go with the clock, we will mention that. Um, so we need to process a lot of big data, and it can be structured and unstructured. So big data will be an integral part of protecting the critical infrastructure, and we can do data analysis. So data analysis is mainly on a testing hypothesis, so we can do that. But also, uh, and there's another aspect that we use uh, big data, is data mining, which is uh, has a main focus on to undisclose unseen connections. Um, what we also can do to protect uh, our uh, critical infrastructure to make things uh, more accessible in a visual way. So we can make use of augmented reality. Augmented reality is not virtual reality because then everything is in the virtual domain. But what you do with augmented reality, you superimpose the virtual reality on the actual reality. So you look, let's so to say, at fine line and then you see in the virtual way what's going on in that plane. Uh, and that's a help, but that's a help uh, how to deal with problems. Very important is machine learning, and especially the deep learning, where the machine uh, learns itself, especially neural networks, make new algorithms, and can process huge amounts of data and see patterns we could never this close as humans. And that's really a value. Another uh, element, uh, more let's say uh, a discuss element, is uh, the issue of narratives. Uh, sometimes we see that the attacks are um, guided by changing the narrative. Uh, we can think of how we can do with that. So, and, and one of the things is behavioral dynamics. It's not undiscussed because it's very close also to manipulation, but it's an issue to, to think about. And finally, if we can do that all and we can integrate it uh, with human analysis, we will come to form of augmented intelligence to protect our critical infrastructure. So if you say artificial intelligence, then you have the subcategory, that's machine learning, and then- Gideon, Gideon, I'm sorry. You have three, yeah. four minutes more. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. I can round it off in it. Yeah. Uh, and then subcategory is uh, deep learning. And with data science, in the data science cell, we can uh, uh, process much, much more information. Since levels have been um, has it been done in the past? Yes, if you look at Haiti 2006 and 7, uh, there was a huge aid program going on, and a lot of citizens around the world were doing analysis. Uh, for example, from which point in Haiti people make cell phone calls and they look for the hubs and they send them the aid to over there. So it was quantitative analysis, you made use of uh, computers. Is quantitative intelligence, and it was very helpful. Um, what you also can do, and some larger banking systems are doing that, they make digital honeypots. So when they are checked, they have a whole system that looks like they're banking, but is actually a digital honeypot. So the attackers think they can steal the information there, but actually what you do, you lead them away from the attack, you learn, you do pattern uh, recognition, and you learn from their uh, attacks. That way is also a means to identify fast, to act faster uh, uh, for your protection. There are some options uh, to be explored further. Uh, two things are really underdeveloped at the moment, and that is quantitative warning problem generation, so that the computers help you with unseen warning problems. And the other one is the quantitative hypothesis generation. So in order not to overlook relevant hypotheses. And the reason that there are, is a problem with this is because there's a lot of causal reasoning going on in doing that. But it would be a help because we would need less. That brings me to the last slide and the preliminary conclusions. Um, we need augmented intelligence. Uh, we can't do without it at the moment. For that, we need data science cells. Um, 
instead of only denial, uh, we also have to rely more on deception in our information society. So it's the uh, thing of the digital honeypots. And we have to take into account that the population is an actor, both ways, perpetrator and censor. And we need that because otherwise the other party will win. Thank you for that. Thank you, Guilherme. Yeah, it was always a pleasure to, to hear you. I'm sorry for for a little bit this time frame, but no, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you you saw that I am trying to cut to be to, uh, trying to be online uh, according to the schedule. Uh, now we have uh, two of us who were the PhD students of Professor Tushman. Uh, first, it's going to be my and Professor Yadran Kalasic Lazic presentation about the Ransfeld matrix. And second one after me is going to be Dr. Roman Donovich, who was also a PhD student of Professor Tushman. Uh, let me share my presentation with you. I will try to be uh, short. I hope, yes, you can see it. Uh, to be honest, you are the Gilliam, one of the reasons why I, I was trying to why I was uh, trying to write something about it because first time when few few years ago when you were at Zagreb Security Forum, we were talking about the Ramsell matrix. And then I entered a little bit more deeply inside because I was always curious to know uh, why some countries when uh, they are trying to establish the system to the hunt countering hybrid threats are trying to search for the unknown unknowns. Well, this is something what Ramsell said in his famous speech in February 12, 2002. That is the last sentence. By, because for me, it's, it's a little bit problem. As, a, as an engineer, if you are searching for unknown unknowns, it means it's very hard to find the research questions that will help you to try to find something. Therefore, without, uh, without qualitative uh, research questions and trying to find what you would like to know where to find it. It's very hard to find it. It's very hard to find the answer. On the other way, as an intelligence officer, there are no, I know that there are no mission impossibles. Therefore, unknown unknowns needs to be redefined. So this is generally this basic matrix of the Ransfeld, Ransfeld non-knowledge, uh, if I can say that. And this red cell unknown unknowns is a real question. Can really this red square or this knowledge can exist as an autonomous part of the knowledge because all of from three form knowledges can exist because no knowns is something what we have a perception that we know uh, the blue dot blue blue uh, uh, quadrant is something that we know that we don't know and we are aware of it and this is something that we would like to do something in future to learn those kind of things and unknown knowns is something that uh, this conscious knowledge that we, we we might not be aware that we know it, but we we have it somewhere in in our mind. And this is the first interpretation of this Ramsfeld theory matrix theory. So knowledge is uh, here guided by the and uh, developed and structured by the perception of the knowledge. And we are talking about the only true knowledge that is based on the facts. Red quadrant is defined a little bit different. We do not know that we do not know. That means that we might be a victim of the disinformation activities, because if we don't know that we don't know, that might think that we are in problems. It means that we might be under the influence of the hybrid attacker in this kind of activities, malicious activities, and that we are forced to know uh, uh, knowledge that is not really knowledge, that, that is more non-knowledge, as we can say. First theorem of the Pro Professor Tujman about the disinformation says that anybody, anyone or anybody who accepts this information as a true, accept all negative consequences of that disinformation also as a true. We were faced with this kind of activities in the beginning of our homeland war, war for the independence in the Croatia, when we were sometimes victims of the of the disinformation activities from the aggressors, but luckily and with the help of the knowledge and experienced people, and we were able to discover and discredit it quite a lot of almost every disinformation that was attempting to ruin the Croatian integrity, Croatian, ruin Croatian unity and our efforts to establish 
uh, independent and free democratic country. Second interpretation of this Rumsfeld theory of matrix of knowledge can be guided by the content. So it's a question of what we really know or what we think that we really know. In that case, this red quadrant means we do not know what we do not know. But in this case, this, this red quadrant cannot exist as a knowledge because in that case, it has to be part of the no blue quadrant knowledge because sometimes in, mo in most cases we know what we know and we think that we know something. But when we know what we do not know, uh, that is a huge area. This is unfinished and unlimited knowledge, but there is a, so many things inside this knowledge that we really don't know what we don't know. Therefore, this red quadrant cannot, cannot exist as a separate knowledge form. And this is one of the things that Professor Tushman was dealing with, organization of the knowledge. Just a second, something has, okay. <coughs> And this, uh, what Rumsfeld said, is not anything, nothing special and nothing new for the uh, information and communication sciences. For example, this is one proverb from the Persian, Persian time that's talking about also about this kind of knowledge, who knows, who doesn't know, who, who needs to know, and what to do with the persons and how to deal with them that thinks they know, how they know it, and what are they aware about their knowledge. The process of gaining of knowledge that is defined by information communication sciences and interpreted by the experts that are dealing with intelligence can be a little bit different structured, the process from data to the wisdom and decision making process. So we are we, when we are collecting data, we transform them into, into the information. Information is transferred to the knowledge and knowledge is based for intelligence that is based for wisdom that Upon the wisdom, we make decisions, and after the decisions, we have a lesson learning process that influences our information and our knowledge. But what we have to do is data needs to be checked for integrity, for the time frame that are required, con their consistency and completeness, because all of those things can influence the fact that we might be exposed to the data that are not real data, that are fake, fake news or fake information. Also, we need to check the sources, reliability, confidentiality, approachability and credibility to see is it really something what we are talking about is or we are faked by the, not just by the content that we are faked by the source. Information needs to be checked and created and defined by its completeness, by the time frame and information needs to be interpret, interpreted according to the necessities and the real exact facts and information needs to be truth. It's not okay if in these information activities, if, uh, information in, in that case is, is fake news, but information that we are using for a positive knowledge that is based for the decision making process, it needs to be truthful. Also, we need to take care about the interpretation of not just information and sourcing data, about the knowledge and the, its usage in a, uh, added value knowledge processes. Also, the transfer of this knowledge and intelligence needs, all of this process needs to be uh, part and result of the planning process, management process, control, and that has a, its uh, uh, part of the control and supervision. It's not, and it cannot be only a system that exists for itself. It needs to be run for uh, some kind of value added uh, things. So, what is missing, by our opinion, in the Rasfer matrix? It's relation between several attributes, data information content, collection process, and transformation of abilities, because not everybody has transformation abilities in order to transform, transfer data that are collected by different sensors to a useful knowledge and truthful knowledge that might be used in order to bring, especially in the cases when the states are endangered in a strategic decision-making process. Therefore, we have a problem that we need to face knowledge against the non-knowledge. In that case, the Donald Rasfer uh, two-dimensional matrix needs to be changed to a 3D model where we have this kind of numbers. Uh, I will share this, this matrix later if somebody would like to know it. But as you can see, it, we have a 
one gr fully green field and one fully red field. Fully green mean field, yes, we know that we know, and this is something what we are doing, and we, based on our knowledge that is true and acceptable knowledge, we are going to bring up decisions that are going to be useful for a strategic making decision process. But red field means, yes, we are exposed to uh, malicious disinformation activities and that is something that we have to avoid in future in order to come to the other parts and other quadrants of this matrix this is in 3d model how it should look like red dot with the zero triple zero combination is this non-knowledge but the green field with three ones is the knowledge that we need to achieve the process from the point zero to the point a sometimes can be very hard can be very demanding but this is the process that has to be done in order to gain the knowledge that is useful. Therefore, I would like to conclude. Ramsell matrix is not suitable to be used in the in original form in information and communication sciences. Neither to intelligence security sciences. It can be one tool, but it cannot be used as such. When we discuss knowledge based on facts, we can say that unknown unknowns in a form of knowledge are part of the known unknowns. That we are aware of the fact what we do not know something, but what we really do not know with that something we really don't know. It's a game of the words, but sometimes when you enter in this in, in this area, it, it's fun, it's interesting. Also. Searching for the unknown unknowns as defined by Ransfeld is questionable because of we cannot ask proper and useful research questions. If we don't have the questions to research, then we cannot find the reason. We, then we cannot find the answer. Try to imagine ourselves that we are sitting and standing up in one field surrounded by different forests, different, different uh, grasses, and that we are standing there, we are thinking, okay, I have to find something to, uh, to answer to the unknown unknowns. And when I know it, when I see it, I will recognize it. But if you don't know what you are looking for, if you are not, if you don't know uh, why you are looking for something, it's very hard to find that you you are going to recognize this is something what I really know. Also, it's we cannot recognize what we are looking for if we find it, and that is why the, one of the reasons why this needs to be changed. Worst case scenario is when when we think that we know but we really do not know and we are not aware of it. This is the red red square. Then we are victims of disinformation activities. And wisdom that is generated by this kind of non-knowledge is dangerous, just like decisions that are produced by it. And this is one of the basic postulates of the theorems of Professor Tujman that he was writing on and about the books and his experience with writing uh, uh, articles and giving the lectures in information communication sciences. Mm -hmm. More than ever, we are witnessing that we are exposed to the malicious activities by the different disinformation activities, and that is the reason why we have to take much more attention to the organization of the knowledge, what Professor Vidovich was talking, uh, saying about, and what Professor De Valk said. Yes, we need to involve the artificial intelligence in this kind of processes in order to help us. And also we have to build up the institutions uh, and the mutual trust between the government and the society in order to, to be helpful to fight against these hybrid threats and disinformation activities. That's all from me for now. And we can discuss it a little bit later if, we are, if you wish. And now I would like to give, give, give a chair to another student of Professor Tujman, uh, Dr. Roman Domovic, who knows also quite a lot about the disinformation activities on the, uh, especially to the homeland war. Roman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gordon, and hello to everyone. I apologize, but I will turn the video off because uh, the sound can be, actually, the sound is good, I think, so, okay, I'll leave it on. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so uh, my presentation analyzes some of the Hague Tribunal's conclusions regarding the Karadjordjo meeting between President Tujman and Milosevic. I was actually inspired by the book Poaching in the Hague, or Hashki Krivolov in uh, Croatian, by Professor Miroslav Tujman, uh, where he showed flaws in the verdicts in Perlic Italia case. I focus specifically on the conclusions related to the meeting in Karadjordjo, the way uh, that they were made. And this presentation is uh, part of broader analysis.
uh, excuse me, but for some reason I can't. You can, okay. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Yeah, okay. So according to the law, as citizens of the state, we must recognize the judgments of the Hague Tribunal. But scientists among us should have a problem with that. Science is a set of systematized and argumentative knowledge, a set of cognitive facts about objective reality in nature and society that has been obtained through the application of scientific methodology. The main features of it are objectivity, reliability, precision, and systematicity, which is, as we shall see, different than methodology of reaching conclusions in the part of the verdicts in the Hague Tribunal. Um, yeah, okay, it goes now. Uh, some basic information about the meeting in Karajorjo. It was held on March 25 in 1991. Participants were President Stujman and Milosevic, and what they were really talking about is a complete unknown. But very interesting information phenomenon, phenomenon came out of it. The entire story developed from a known content, myth of the agreement on partition of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Karadžorđevo, which I call mother of all frauds in information operations related to the Croatian War of Independence and President Tudjman. I will call it just division or partition uh, further on. In the case of Richard Alia, the meeting in Karadžorđevo is in both instances of the verdict. The first instance the verdict, which is upheld in the second instance, mentions it in the section Joint Criminal Enterprise, section one, objectives of the JCE charged in the indictment, one ultimate objective of the JCE. We see the paragraph on the judgment and its content. Uh, trial chamber refers to the evidence in footnote 20, referenced directly to Karajorjo meeting, and footnote 21, reference to the manner of division. Now, uh, the trial chamber stated that Tujman met with Milosevic to specify plans for the partition of Bosnia and Herzegovina between uh, Croatia and Serbia, noting in the form of an inserted sentence that the chamber has no detailed information about those plans. This wording is imprecise because it is unclear what exactly the trial chamber does not know in detail. One, in general, about Tujman and Milosevic plans and consequently about the details of Karadžorđo meeting, in which case it makes no sense to draw conclusions on the content of the meeting and make judgment on that basis. Second, in general, about their plans, with exception of details from, the, from that meeting, where judges believe that they have enough details on the basis of testimony so that they could reach a verdict. Uh, referenced evidence is part of the testimony of the prosecution witnesses, so uh, now it remains to be seen what the witnesses said. For this occasion, I prepared the testimonies of Josip Manolic, close associate of Franja Tudjman, and Cyril Ribicic, a Slovenian politician. In its, uh, in its judgment in relation to the meeting, the trial chamber refers to parts of the testimony on pages 4273 to 4277 and on page 4472. The first problem in concluding process is selectivity. The trial chamber did not take into account Manolich next to answers, which extends from page 4277 to page 4278. Two answers from the page contained important details and in addition to that, there is another important answer on page 4282. Review and comparison of all answers show illogicality and inconsistency in answers resulting in one of two outcomes. One, lying. Two, manipulating information by making a statement in the form of fact instead of assumption or ambiguity. But in that case, it could not be used as a crown evidence for JC. Problem number two is inconsistency. In cross-examination by defense, Manolich said that he didn't say that they agreed on division, but that they discussed it, which we can see marked with the red square in the part of the testimony. Manolich answers does not match the answers to earlier questions of Prosecutor Scott. We can see them here uh, where he said, A, uh, that Tujman and Milosevic agreed in principle on the issue of partition, B, that the agreement of partition is a fact, and C, that probably Milosevic was also satisfied with, the, with what they agreed on. Therefore, Manolich first said that they agreed on, or at least agreed in principle, and later, when directly asked 
whether he said that Tujman agreed with Milosevic on division, he replied that he didn't say that, but that they had negotiated. In addition to Manolich statements, the court used the Karajorjo meeting as evidence for division based on allegations from Manolich book published uh, in 1995. The book is not Manolich work, but selected answers from his interviews. There is a problem number three, which is methodological error. The problem is with the book as such, because in the book, everything is presented as one answer. Um, but in fact, each of the passages is an answer to a separate question, which can give different perspective. Although in the form of an interview, the book has no questions, but only answers with notes and interpretations by the book's editor, which is suggested. Problem number four are logical errors. The logical error in the first answer is, is that in the case of at least one negative premise, an affirmative conclusion can't be drawn. Even if it is true that Tujman agreed with Milosevic on something, if he never openly told anyone what he agreed on, uh, if he agreed on, except for maybe some indications, then it is not possible to conclude that they agreed on the division. In fact, without knowing the details of the conversation, it is not possible to conclude that they were agreeing or agreed or anything at all. One may think that some indications point to an agreement, but my knowledge does not state what these indications are and whether they relate to the content of the conversation or the existence of the conversation. Now let's break it down to into premises and conclusion. I intend to make Venn diagrams for this uh, as well in written work. Uh, the conclusion can't be affirmative because one of two premises, premise number two, is negative. So according to the rule of logical reasoning, the correct conclusion can only be negative, which is, for example, it is not known what they agreed on. In order for conclusion to be affirmative, both premises must be affirmative. Actually, the second premise must have content like, for example, Tujman said that they agreed on division. And in addition, if nothing is known about something, then the characteristics of that something can't be determined. Now we can derive the proof uh, based on the truth of the premise. If we assume that the premises are true, can we find an example that allows the premises to be true, but which clearly contradicts the conclusion? Such an example would be, Tujman and Milosevic did not agree on the division of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Such a conclusion would be logically correct, since we have a negative conclusion derived on the basis of a negative premise, but incorrect in content because, again, we don't know what they were talking about. We have questionable reliability of conclusion. And another example would be, it is not known whether Tujman and Milosevic agreed on the division of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This example is both logically correct and content correct and reliable. Uh, here we have second logical problem, which is generalization. In such serious matters as trial or scientific research, attention should be paid to detail, especially in terms of precision and completeness. We can see where Manolich says that everything that followed the negotiations in Karadzhojevo clearly shows that Tujman and Milosevic agreed on the division. In order to confirm this statement in science, it is necessary to find out what everything is. To analyze the circumstances and the cause and effect sequence of everything, which means the events to which the statement refers and to conclude whether it is true or not. The same should have been done by the trial chamber if it rendered the verdict on the basis of this statement. Um, we now turn to witness Cyril Ribicic as proof the statement from his book Genesis of a Fallacy or Genesis of a the Creation was taken, and I underlined an important part. Uh, what are the problems with Ribicic? He is not direct witness to the meeting in Karadzhojevo. He is not a person from narrow or wide circle near Tujman nor Milosevic, which means that he could not find about Milosevic's alleged offer to Tujman from the two of them. Moreover, he is neither a Croat nor a Serb, but a Slovenian and did not directly participate in the events related to the war in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Later on, even if, if it is true that Milosevic offered Tujman the partition, that does not mean that Tujman accepted it. If he didn't accept it, then they didn't agree on it. And if they didn't agree on it, then, it, then the claim that an agreement on the division took place in Karadzhojevo is untrue. If it is unknown whether they discussed it at all, then it can't be concluded that they made to specify plans for the division of Bosnia and Herzegovina between Croatia and Serbia as stated in the verdict. 
As for Rebic's testimony, her Georgia meeting was mentioned in his testimony in the Cornish case. He was asked if he knew that the meeting was held and if he knew what he, uh, what he represented. Uh, we see what he answered. He can give his opinion on what happened because there are a lot of statements about it. He heard the story of the division secondhand from colleagues in Croatia. In other words, he personally knows nothing about it. This raises a number of questions, especially regarding colleagues from Croatia, who and how can confirm the truth of the allegations about the division that Rivicic heard. Does Rivicic have a source for that allegation? Who is that source? Who is the source to the source if we know that no one was present at the meeting except Tujman and Milosevic, and so on? There are too many unknowns, and with the fact that Rivicic could find out the potential details of the meeting at least secondhand, it is not reasonable to conclude that this is an undeniable truth and draw a firm conclusion based on that as part of the verdict. So we come to the conclusion, at least some parts of the judgments are not relevant in scientific terms because they are based on selected evidence, biased testimony, methodological errors, factual errors, and incoherent logical reasoning. Some relevant evidence may be presented, but may not be used in judgment. It may be even thrown out as evidence. The testimonies are particularly controversial. The prosecution and the defense can brief witnesses on what to say and what not to say. Witnesses do not have to testify about what can incriminate them. Witnesses can lie, even though they are sworn to tell the truth. They can hide details that do not benefit their particular party and highlight only those that are in favor of it. So, such things are contrary to scientific methodology and therefore cannot be considered as facts that shape knowledge about a particular event. And uh, thank you. <laughs> for your uh, attendance. This will conclude my presentation. Thank you, Roman, for this in-depth analysis. And this is something that uh, that needs to be done in order to show how to transfer unknown unknowns that I was talking about to the green field, to the known knowns, because the, the scientific methods and activities and analysis needs to be done in order to transfer and to change the disinformation in information and in order to make them publicly active. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Silvana Maric Tokic for our next presentation, the role of disinformation in public knowledge shaping. Silvana, are you with us? Yes. Uh, okay, zahvaljam. thank you. Zahvaljam na pozor prije svega na ovaj na međunarodni uh, znanstveni stup u čas pokornog profesora Miroslava Tuđmana u svoje ime, u svoje ime kolege Ivice Skoke. Drago nam je naravno što sudjelujemo, ukoliko vidi, mislim da smo mi jedini iz Bosne i Hercegovine. Htjela bi ovo iskoristiti kao priliku prije svega. Niste, niste jedini. A nismo jedini, a onda nam je još draže. Da pozdravim njegovu obitelj, njegove suradnike, vlast kao organizator ovoga skupa i da nam je drago još jednom da smo dio ovoga skupa. Što se ni tiče našeg rada, mi ćemo nešto reći vezano zapravo za naše doktorske dizertacije i za sam profesor Bosne i Hercegovine, za profesor javnog znanja koji je izgrađen na temelju nekakvih podataka i činjenica koji su šireni kroz metije tijekom ratnih sukoba u razdoblju od 1992. do 1995. godine. No prije toga bih htjela nešto reći o samom pojmu informacije, dezinformacije, prostoru, javnom prostoru, zatim prostoru javnog znanja, te koja je uloga medija zapravo u tom oblikovanju javnog prostora i javnog znanja. Znamo da je od uvijek informacija na neki način bila srž ljudske komunikacije od samog početka pa do danas, no nekako sa ovim suvremenim dobom, informacijskim dobom, spojevom masovnih medija, možemo reći da ona postala ne samo ključ napretka i razvoja, nego i ključ nadmetanja tko će dominirati informacijama, tko će kontrolirati javni prostor, koju vrstu medija ćemo iskoristiti za kontrolu tog javnog prostora, zatim koja je uloga medija u svemu tome, te na koji način se oblikuje recimo javno znanje o određenim događajima i osobama itd. Kao što je profesor Čuđman u brojnim svojim radima i knjigama istaknuo, informacije su postale ključ element i napredka i razvoja, ali nije su skupljavanja, odnosno borbe 
za informacije, za informacijsku superiornost, za informacijsku nadmoć na osnovu koje će se graditi nekakve buduća vidjenja događaja, konstrukcije osoba, događaja i na osnovu toga će se graditi javno znanje zapravo o tim događajima. Ono što je uvučeno zapravo da uz informacije imamo rašte druge vidove informacije, odnosno dezinformacija i pogrešna informacija koje na neki način preuzimaju primat nad samim informacijama u tom informacijskom medijskom prostoru, zašto da bi ovladali javnim prostorom i da bi nametovali neke vlastite interese. Rašte elite ili političke ili ekonomske ili kulturne ili bilo koje druge koriste informacije u svrhu manipuliranja javnim znanjem i javnim prostorom da bi njihovo znanje bilo dominantno i da bi informacije koje oni zapravo izlažu bile odlučujuće i na osnovu koji bi se mogli projektirati neki budući događaj i neke buduće stvari koje se mogu odraziti na točno određene skupine u ovom slučaju narode. Ono što je profesor Tudjman zapravo uočio u niz drugih znanstvenika i srećevača da je informacija postala ključ nacionalne pomoći, grade se nacionalne informacijske strategije, nacionalne informacijske politike, informacijske operacije s ciljem dominacije određenih interesnih skupina, određenih naroda u društvu. Kada je u pitanju sam taj prostor javnog znanja, bitno je zaključiti da taj prostor zapravo nikada nije bio nekakva idilična razmjena informacija, nije se temeljio nikada na potpuno istinitim informacijama i možemo reći da je uvijek bio nekako razdjeljen između raštih skupina unutar određenog društva. E sad, koje informacije će dominirati tim javnim znanjem? U većini slučaja dominiraju informacije interesnih skupina koji uspiju zapravo vladati informacije s tim medijskim prostorom, koji uspiju nametnuti svoje viđenje zapravo slavnosti i na osnovu toga se zapravo pamćenje o tim događajima obukuje na osnovu toga javnog znanja. S druge strane, kad uzme u obzir recimo rašt gledanje na javno znanje kroz nekakav društveni i vremenski kontekst, možemo očiti nešto drugo, da pojedina znanja, ta dominanta znanja, nakon određenog vremenskog i društvenog konteksta zapravo nestaju sa scene, zapravo ili se brišu ili potpuno izumiru ili su obezrijeđena. To nabilje možemo prikazati na primjeru nekakvih totalitarnih sustava, pa i samog komunističkog sustava koji je djelovao na tlu Bosne i Hercegovine. Tisuće znanstvenih radova, recimo je preko noći obezrijeđeno, Nekakve teze o socijalizmu, o političkom samoupravljanju zapravo više nisu bile dio tog javnog znanja, no ono što je znakovito da je pamćenje o tim radovima, odnosno jedan dio tog pamćenja i dalje ostao korijenjem i dalje se projektira na nekakva buduća događanja. Odnosno, znanje može se promijeniti u društvenog i vremenskog konteksta, ali neke odrednice toga znanja zapravo i dalje obstaju. Mi smo kroz ovaj rad zapravo pokušali povezati i na neki način informacijske znanosti i političke znanosti i medijske znanosti, te smo kroz analizu dvaju tjednika, bošnjačkih tjednika koji su izlazili u razdoblju od 1992. do 1995. godine, odnosno u tom ratnom razdoblju, pokušali ćemo prikazati zapravo na koji način se širma dezinformacije s ciljem utjecaja na javni prostor i s ciljem dominacije javnog znanja samo jednog od naroda, u ovome slučaju bošnjačkog naroda. Izvojili smo dva tjednika, to su BH, Dan i Viljan. Uradili smo analizu tekstova koji su objavljeni u tom ratom i razdoblju. Zbog prevelike količine tih tekstova koji se tiču Hrvata i hrvatske politike, što u Hrvatskoj, što u Bosni i Hercegovini, mi smo izvojili samo mali broj tekstova da bismo potvrdili svoju tezu da se kroz velik broj dezinformacija želi oblikovati zapravo javno znanje prema vlastitom viđenju, a to viđenje u ovome slučaju izgradnja Bosne i Hercegovine kao nekakve unutarne građanske države bez mogućnosti da druga dva naroda s nekakvim prijedlozima, doponama, izmenama utječu na uređenje Bosne i Hercegovine. Kažem, mi nećemo citirati, niti ćemo na ovaj način kroz ovo izlaganje zapravo prikazati vama te citate, ali ćemo kroz samo jedan od mitova koji je izgrađen unutar tih medija, a to je podjela Bosne i Hercegovine od strane Hrvatske i Srbije, odnosno predsjednika Franje Tuđmana i predsjednika Slobodana Meloševića, 
prikazati zapravo na koji način se šire dezinformacije, odnosno na koji način se stvara matrica dezinformacije na koju se poslije nadovezuje niz drugih dezinformacija. Naravno, sve to utječe i na projekciju nekih novih sukoba, ali na nekakvu konstrukciju događaja nakon odmaka od nekih 20 i nešto godina. U tim tekstovima prvo što se spominje je dogovoreni rat između Republike Hrvatske i odnosno Franje Tuđmana i Slobodana Miloševića sa par činjenica odnosno i podataka kojima ćemo to povrgnuti zapravo nikada nije u pitanju bio dogovoreni rat. Zašto? Zato što recimo sukob u Hrvatskoj počinje već 1991. godine. Istovremeno počinje sukob u Bosni i Hercegovini, iako se za službeno početak rata u Bosni i Hercegovini uzima 1992. Iako je opće poznato je da napad na selo Ravno i okolcu počinje već 1991. godine. Druga činjenica je zašto dogovoreni rat kada je Republika Hrvatska već 1992. godine u najvećem postotku zapravo bila napadnuta sa teritorija Bosne i Hercegovine koji je bio pod okupacijom zapravo jedna iz srpskih paravojnih postrojba. Zatim zašto bi Tuđman dijelio Bosnu i Hercegovinu kada je prilikom samostalnosti, odnosno pokretanja postupka samostalnosti, pozvao Hrvati u Bosni i Hercegovini da izađu na referendum i da glasa i za slobodnu i suverenu Bosnu i Hercegovinu. To su samo neke očinjenica koje poništavaju tu tezu da je postao dogovoreni rat. Teza je išao u smjeru da se zapravo izgradi ta neka komutarna građanska Bosna i Hercegovina, da su bošnjaci zapravo najgroženiji narod u Bosni i Hercegovini, da imaju najmanje teritorija. Na taj način je se već 1992. godine u tom članku izašao u novinama BH Dani upozoravalo zapravo ili preosjećalo se neki novi sukobi koji su dogodili zapravo 1993. godine između Hrvata i Bošnjaka u Bosni i Hercegovini. Druga matrica dezinformacije koja se veže na tezu dogovorenog rata je zamjena dijelova teritorija između Republike Hrvatske zapravo i Bosne i Hercegovine, odnosno recimo Hercegovina za zapadnu Slavonu i tako dalje, što je se medijski nastojala zapravo propagirati. Postavlja se pitanje zašto bi Tuđman recimo mijenjao Slavoniju za Hercegovinu kada je uvelike nastojao osoboditi taj dio teritorija zapravo ta dva područja možemo, odnosno područje Slavonije je bilo okruženo sa puno jačim neprijateljem, sa četvrtom vojnom silom u Evropi, tada nasojao je osoboditi i teritorij i vlastito stanovništvo. Još jedna od teza koja se vežu uz ovu tezu je humanitarno preseljenje stanovništva, recimo preseljenje stanovništva Srednje Bosne, koje se također navodi u citatima tih novina, gdje se kaže da je Tuđma preselio velik broj stanovništva, iz Slavonije, iz Srednje Bosne, nikakve teze o tom preseljenju stanovništva nisu opravdane. Kad se recimo zna da je Tuđman na sve načine i vojno i diplomatski pomagao Bosnu i Hercegovinu, njeno stanovništvo, da je ustrajao na njenom jedinstvu, da je recimo prihvatio velik broj izbjeglica, velik broj ranjenih u Hrvatske bolnice, da je slao i materijalnu pomoć i organizirao različite konvoje koji su trebali pomoći Bosni i Hercegovini i tako dalje. Sljedeće što se čini u tom medijskom informacijskom prostoru kada te teze nemaju uporište, da se izlače oporbeni čelnic Hrvatskog naroda u Hrvatskoj, to su Stjepan Mesić, Osip Manulić i Ivo Banac, koji objavljuju razne intervjuje u tim dvama tjednicima. Zašto? Da bi na neki način svrgali predsjednika Tuđmana i da bi došli do vlasti, a bošnjački političari to koriste da bi potvrdili svoje teze da je Hrvatska isti agresor kao Srbija, da je Franjo Tuđman isti zločinac kao Sloboda Milošević, ako i ne veći i niz drugih teza. Ono što na neki način nije medijski zapravo vidljivo ili je vidljivo u samom dijelu medija koje nema širi dio tog prostora javnog znanja je da primjerice se izostavljaju recimo izjave ministra vanjskih poslova Mate Granića koji je bio ministar od 1993. do 2000. i koji u svojim izjavama koji je dao za par televizijskih postaja navodi da je Alija Izetbegović više navrata nudio predsjedniku Tuđmanu podijel u Bosne i Hercegovine južno od prozora da uzmu Hrvati i da se Mostar podijeli na pola, a da sjeverni dio uzmu Bošnjaci. Te izjave ili nisu dio javnog prostora, ili nisu dio medijskog prostora, a najmanje su dio javnog znanja zapravo. 
Zašto? Zato što oni nisu niti u interesu bošnjačke politike, nisu u interesu opodbenih čelnika u Hrvatskoj, a pogotovo one međunarodne zajednice koja je u svojim nekakvim kasnim istupima također govorila o tom nekakvom podjelenom, podjeli BH, dogovorenom ratu, da su Hrvati isti agresor kao i Srbija i NA i niz drugih zapravo mitova koji je izrađen na, kada su u pitanju Hrvati u Hrvatskoj i Hrvati u BH. Kažem, taj prostor javnog znanja nije celovit prostor, ali bit tog prostora je da nosu od tih mitova i stereotipa i predrasuda koje su izrađene o Republici Hrvatskoj, predsjedniku Tuđmanu, o Hrvatima u Bosni i Hercegovini i njihovom izabravnom političkom vosu, da se danas konstruiraju zapravo događaj koji će se odrasti na sliku Hrvata u Bosni i Hercegovini, da se na neki način svaki oblik prijedlog Hrvata u Bosni i Hercegovini za drugačiji pokušaj uređenja koji će da dovoljiti interese svih triju konstitutivnih naroda prikazuju u nekakvom negativnom smislu, a svaki pokušaj suradnje ili prijedlog u strane Republike Hrvatske i dan danas se prikazuje kao nešto negativo i napad na Bosnu i Hercegovini. Zahvala. Thank you very much, Silvana. This is one of the excellent examples that uh, how disinformations can negatively influence not just to the national public knowledge, also to the international public sphere and creation of decisions in, in different spheres, in political, academical, and even judicial. Uh, now we, we came to the part that we would like to start the discussions between uh, all of you who are still with us and the, the these excellent papers and presentation that we were able to hear. As a matter of fact, when we were making the programs, we didn't know exactly what was the topic of any paper that is going to be presented today, but they fit almost perfectly by my personal opinion, especially in the second part of the panel when Gilliam opened it with the black holes in the analysis, what we have to find and what we have to detect in order to uh, to lower the, the threshold of the activities that needs to be recognized. And with the unknown unknowns that needs to be transferred to the field of the known knowns, to the knowledge that might be used in order to fight the modern threats against the societies and the states, because hybrid threats are not just threats to the intelligence or the critical infrastructure or just for a state they are the they are most the in main case the most uh, the the large number of cases they are uh to, they are faced toward the societies their integrity their homogeneity in order to divide to divide society so to 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 implement this old roman verb per uh, divided uh, impere I would like to invite you, maybe if someone of you has some kind of questions for any of the speakers or for any of us, and then we can continue with this with this program. Slavko. And Slavko is not with us. <clears throat> let me uh, let me say a few words. Uh, if if you want to uh, rise, if you want to ask any question or comment. Please you raise your hand and I'm going to see it and then we can. Ah, Thomas. Thank you very much yes. and thank you to all the speakers for, for, for some, some sorry, fascinating. I, sorry, I Thomas. I, yes, I can hear, I can see you and we can do it because sorry for not giving the word immediately because I didn't saw you in the other computer. Thank you. Okay, fine. Well, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for some, some fascinating uh, some fascinating presentations. I have a lo lot of questions, but I think I'll just uh, just take a uh, take a few of them. Um, I've, I myself is of course a historian, so many of them go in that kind of direction. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to ask our. But uh, you are Cold called War historian, so you know what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, first, I would like to ask Vladik uh, uh, Vladislav Bovhak about the uh, intelligence cooperation, but I would very very like to hear about the echo of this. Since we're talking about networks and and disinformation, um, how uh, what what was done to pr pretend the old networks, Warsaw Pact networks, to to become to get an afterlife, so to speak, inside the Western alliances in the 90s and the 2000s? Um, 
So Roman, I just had a, a just had a, a, a very short question because you were talking a very, very concrete case, but um, but uh, I are just pointing to the to the to the uh, quite normal fact that that justice and history are two different things. In court, you need to get people tried and you get people convicted. In history, we are trying to find out. Um, to try and out what really happened, and I think that's really two uh, two different set of 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 ambition. Um, so that was just a historian question, and 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 Gordon uh, more, but I would just round out by by, by you, Jordan, um, because you started saying, yeah, we encounter uh, you encounter disinformation campaigns in the uh, in, in the nineties, and we and we and, and we're able to to to, re, to 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 block them off. Could you be a little bit more specific? Uh, could you please give a? I don't know, you, and there's no so much time, but could you please be a little bit more specific? I will, but Vladik first, Vladik first, then Roman, and then I'm going to be the last. Vladik sound, yeah, yes, I have to uh, switch on the phone, uh, uh, microphone. Okay, uh, so the question is, uh, uh, and the problem is that uh, we have a uh, very detailed information on okay sometimes some kind of black spots in it but uh, related to the communist times because we have a situation of completely declassified materials uh, about it uh, but the whole the whole story is cut somehow in the 1990 in the case of Poland uh, and we have the we have some knowledge that some operations are uh, simply continued but some, some some kinds of methods are pre precisely uh, the same and also we can in many cases guess at least uh, that uh, some operations started or some networks organizing uh, organized in the uh, okay communist era simply operate uh, also uh, later. Uh, okay, I just took from, uh, from from my bookshelf. Maybe you can see it. This is the comment uh, documentation uh, documentation of the uh, another court in the court of justice uh, when the Polish Prime Minister Józef Oleksy was uh, 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 accused of being. Uh, uh, a Soviet spy, and there was a, a huge, a huge, huge uh, uh, prosecutors and uh, uh, and also secret services documentation from the 90s also published, with, certainly with a lot of black spots. And but we can see in it uh, that the uh, methods uh, and especially uh, method of uh, obtaining so-called. Um, uh, Trusted contacts, is a kind of a, a source of information, uh, which is not a re regular agent, but a person who is delivering some information and is cooperating for some reasons uh, with uh, uh, with uh, with one on another intelligence service is still the same. So <clears throat> we are talking about the history. We are talking about some. Uh, uh, some uh, methods and some uh, uh, elaborated uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, but uh, uh, many of them simply becoming uh, becoming more complex, more intellectually complicated, and more related to the data proce pro processing methods and uh, technologies. But okay, they're very uh ideas and the very and the, also the people uh, remain the same and this is the my answer to your question i hope thank you vladislav roman yeah thank you for the question thomas um yeah we can often hear that it is something like that because they said so in the hate no like we often can hear it from politicians from media uh, from biased people, but however, the world around us, like historical events, technological developments, etc., is successfully described by science, not by court judgments. So, as we can see, drawing conclusions based on pseudo evidence does not lead to an accurate description of historical events. See, I mean, parts of judgment 
can be true, but <laughs> this judgment is not true, at least the part of this judgment. Okay. Uh, I will give you a few examples, Thomas. Thanks for the question. Uh, but I will give you just a few of them, despite the fact that we, we know, and I know personally, and we from the, that we very intelligent, we know dozens of those cases. But uh, I will tell you just a few of them that are, um, let's say, most popular and most known in creation, uh, between the creation and public knowledge. The first one is, uh, is connecting with what Roman was talking about, for example. Uh, we were accused in the beginning, end of 1990 and beginning of 91 that the our new government is a pro-Nazi, pro tasha pro government and the Croatia does not need to be recognized because this is going to be another uh, Nazi government that is uh, that will try to do ethnic crimes and, and different kind of uh, uh, negative uh, activities against the any non-Croatian population. And in, in a way, that what Serbian government and Yugoslavian government position was in that, in that uh, time to spread so many different disinformation about the Croatia, not just in Croatia and Serbian, in that time Yugoslavian public knowledge sphere, they tried to do it in, 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 in international public sphere. One of them is that uh, when it was in January 91, end of the January 91, it was a famous meeting of the presidency of former Yugoslavia, 24, 25th and 26th of January, when there was, everything was prepared for the coup d'etat. And by the information operations of the Yugoslavian military the counterintelligence, it was prepared uh, the reason why and how to, to organize coup d'etat in Croatia to overthrow the Croatian government and to arrest everybody down there. And one of the activities that was the, that was happened before this coup d'état, it was a, a secret agreement signed between that time President Kuchan, so president of the Slovenian presidency, whose head of the cabinet was Cyril Rivicic, and he is the one who mentioned Roman mentioned him as a, a case in this court tribunal case that he testified in a wrong way with fake news, and they signed agreement with Milosevic so that they can. Serbs would agree that Slovenia left Yugoslavia without any problems, but Slovenes, Slovenian government at that time uh, supported the Milosevic idea that the republican borders are not definite borders, that, but intercommission later announced and confirmed the dissolution of Yugoslavia. They agreed that Serbs, wherever they live, they have a right to make their own government, their state. And it was the bloody entrance to the wars in, in Yugoslavia. Second thing is that when aggressor realized that we defended ourselves and that we are cre creating a stable base in international community, they start to make uh, uh, another they increase the level of disinformation activities and then they transfer themselves not just to the informational, they did it in the physical, physical sphere and physical domain of activities. Somewhere in the mid August 91, uh, in uh, morning in Zagreb was, uh, was people in Zagreb was, were woke up uh, hearing several very huge explosions. And it was seen that the entrance to the Jewish community office in Zagreb was uh, a, a ID, ex improvised explosive device was uh, placed there and exploded. And in 15 minutes later, the Jewish cemetery in Zagreb was also destroyed by several explosions. And immediately the Serbian uh, uh, press released that information that Ustasha government in Croatia is uh, anti-Semitic and uh, pro-Nazi government that he, that will probably try to impose all of those war crimes again what Ustasha uh, crime regime did it in Second World War. But with the help of the police and intelligence, we were able to arrest lots of those guys who did it, who planned it, who organized it. And it was proved to be uh, case officers and agents of the military counterintelligence of Yugoslavia, members of the fifth detachment of the counterintelligence group of the Yugoslavian Air Force and, and anti-artillery, anti-aircraft uh, uh, department that were settled up in Zagreb in this area. Third thing is, for example, it was in first in October 91, as far as I remember now, when the attack to the Dubrovnik starts and the troops, military troops from, for example, from 
Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Montenegro that start to attack and shell the the with huge amount of the bombs to the city of Dubrovnik, which is under the UNESCO protection. And they were they were even uh, I don't want to say crazy, but they even filmed that how they are shelling the Dubrovnik. They said yes. Uh, we are we are doing activities, but not on the city of Dubrovnik. We are doing on the upskirts and the neighborhood of the Dubrovnik. But what is what is able to be seen that those bombs that are falling to the city of Dubrovnik is a fight between the Croats and forty thousand Kurd terrorists that are uh, set up down there in Dubrovnik in order to make an aggression against the Montenegro. So it was easy to discover this this information. Uh, next one is, for example. When after the Battle of the Vukovar, in it was 19th and 20th of November 1991, when the city of Vukovar failed under the uh, pressure and aggression of the Serbian and Yugoslavian troops, there was an article that was published in Večernje Novosti. This is mostly sell the daily newspapers in Yugoslavia at that time. That the Ustasha, it's a Croatian soldiers and uh, acronym for the for the uh, that the Serbs used for, against us, killed 40 Serbian babies in one kindergarten in Borovo Selo. And then the, the pre President Tujman tried to make an investigation, despite the fact that we were not in the control of this area, but we were able to, to make the investigation, deep investigation, and in only two days we discovered that this is a real fake news, that first this kindergarten does not exist, those but this does not exist and this has never happened and then it was the the serbian tv belgrade tv national tv was forced to publicly announce yes we uh, we are set up to the disinformation activities and we would like to apologize that we published something that is not completely true but nevertheless next day they continue to, uh, with those information, uh, uh, with articles, yes, the the bodies of those babies exist. There are evidences, movie evidences of this uh, war crime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it was able, we, we were able later to restore it and to discover all of those persons who were part of those illegal activities, disinformation activities. Uh, then we have this. Uh, Meet about the division of the Bosnia and Herzegovina in Georgia, and especially for me, it's very hard to 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 know that. And I can see here that uh, Mrs. Rauka Bushić, she was uh, in the cabinet of the President Tuđman at that time, and I, I was uh, not once present when President Tuđman gave the order to the intelligence community: we have to keep Bosnia and Herzegovina alone and alive and united because this is the only way how we can protect not just the interests of Croatia. In Croatia, we, it's, we need to protect the interests of all the citizens in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are, there are also, there is incredible, maybe something for you, because this is a remnant of the Cold War. I'm sorry for I'm being a little bit longer than it was that I should be. Uh, I remember one disinformation activities also from the 92, January 92, when it was it a was few, uh, few weeks before we received the international recognition process. The Serbian uh, propaganda machine uh, sent, up, sent to the international community information that Croatian Democratic Union, leading party at that time in Croatia, run by the President Tuđman, still in 1988 uh, have agreed and allowed to uh, free Iranian citizens to get a transit visa through Yugoslavia in order for them to, to leave Iran and go to United Kingdom. Uh, why this disinformation is dangerous? Because those three guys were later accused by one of the investigation journalists that were part of the plot to destroy this Panam Airlines that that crashed in uh, in the Lockerbie case. Second, the problem is that in 1988, uh, HDZ or Croatian Democratic Union did not exist. It started to exist somewhere in the middle of 1989. And uh, third one is that the the Serbian regime tried to connect us with the international terrorist groups, not just with Iranians, with 
as, as a Iranian, but with Hezbollah and with those guys who did it from Libya. So briefly, there are just four or five this disinformation that I that I have in my mind. Of course, I know quite a lot of them, but uh, we can spend the old night when you are going to an evening when you are going to become here to Zagreb to discuss about those topics. Uh, I would like to ask you. Uh, is there if there are any other comments and, and and questions for for the speakers or we can conclude this part and i would like to ask you thomas are you satisfied with this answer uh, thank you very much uh, it was my pleasure to have you here all of you and really i appreciate it that you you are with us all the day this, especially to you my friends from abroad that most of those things that we were talking today you were not understand and you did not know so that's obvious because you don't speak croatian but i promise you next time when we are going to be in zagreb we will speak croatian but this is the way how we try to give them more area and to the, the younger scientists uh, younger researchers and also we are in Croatia and we have to also have something in, in Croatian language. Uh, if there are no, I can see, I cannot see any other hands raised. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's my, it's my, it was my privilege to be here with you to run the panel. My colleagues told me that it was not possible to see that three times my, my my internet was broken, but nevertheless, uh, at uh, 1500 hours, we are going to continue with the Croatian panels. The uh, chair is going to be Dr. Nives Mikelic Peradovic. She is the, she is down there. Well, she is in isolation. I hope that she's better now. Nives, are you okay? I'm not in, I'm not in isolation anymore, but my two kids are in self isolation starting today. So you, you could see the youngest uh, crawling around me. <laughs> well, Nives, you have a still time in front of you because as far as I know, Thomas, you have five kids. Nives, try so, to imagine how many times he has to be in isolation. So one more. I have one more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, once more, thank you very much. I appreciate it very uh, uh, that you are that you are together with us. We will continue with at 1500 hours with uh, Nives. I hope that we are going to receive the papers to publish it in in a uh, journal later. And as as uh, you as you know it, in five minutes you are going to be able to see this live recording in the YouTube again. Thank you very much, and see you at three o'clock. Thank you.